I guess um, we can start slowly. So thank you very much for coming to see this talk. I know there's a lot of competition and this is a massive conference and you could have gone to see the latest TypeScript changes and things like that. Um, I'm not gonna kind of um, have anything particularly valuable as TypeScript for you here today or the new .NET Core or anything like that. Um, but what I'd like to kind of challenge you to think about a bit more is whether you're making any silly assumptions that are making somebody else's life miserable. And I think as developers, we got to the point where we are kind of ruling the world now. Stuff really, really depends on us, and when it breaks, it breaks horribly badly. And um, unfortunately for lots of teams, we get so divorced and so far away from people who suffer for our mistakes that we don't even understand how silly things can get. Um, I'm, I'm primarily a developer. I, I've started kind of building stuff um, for money about 20 years ago. Before that, I was building stuff on computers for free. But I've always been fascinating, fascinated how computers around me seem to break for no apparent reason. So about um, 14 or 15 years ago, I moved from Serbia to the UK. And on my second day there, I tried to open a bank account with the emphasis on tried. Because in, in Serbia, kind of opening a bank account is relatively easy. You go to the bank, you say, I'd like to open a bank account. Here's my ID card. Five minutes later, you're done. The UK does not have ID cards. Um, and then because they lack a concept of identity there, they have to ask you for your shoe size, blood group, mother's made the name and go through your entire history until they can verify that you are you. Although I had a passport there, it doesn't matter. Kind of so, um, the, the nice lady trying to open my bank account went through about 40 minutes of filling in forms of all the weirdest data you can give them. And then after 45 minutes said, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to open a bank account for you today. It's like, okay, why not? And she said, well, says here you've not paid your taxes last year. Now, kind of, I know, you know, there's a big divide between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. In Northern Europe, taxes are something people are really proud about paying because it finances your roads, it gives you a good government and things like that. The more south you go, taxes become more optional. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, yes, I had paid my taxes last year in full. Uh, and I said, look, uh, kind of, Here's my passport, here's my boarding pass from two days ago. Like, your computer would not be able to know if I paid my taxes last year, but I did. And he said, no, 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 we would know. I said, like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, the tax office in Serbia has two computers, and at this moment, they're running 100% of their CPU playing solitaire. So, no, you wouldn't know. <laughs> like... And then after about half an hour of persuasion, she says, okay, okay, I understand. She picks up a phone, she calls somebody, she gets passed on to somebody else, she gets passed on to somebody else. She explains the whole passport boarding pass thing. And then about five minutes later, some wizard comes down from, you know, 10 floors above, presses some magic key combinations on the keyboard so we can skip to the next form. And then, you know, we start filling in another shoe size blood group, mother's maiden name, and everything like that. 10 minutes later, she says, oh, unfortunately, we're still not gonna be able to open a bank account for I said, okay, what's now? You know, she said, well, it says here, you've been recently released from prison. <laughs> like, whoa, wow. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's interesting, so pff, no. You know, passport, boarding pass again, this whole thing. And this is okay, okay, okay. And she phones up somebody and 10 minutes later, this guy comes back, presses a pedal, kicks the computer, you know, some magic key combination, we go and move on. About three of these magic key combinations later, I get a bank account, a credit card, and you know, I, I could have gotten like a, the whole bank if I wanted by that point, I, I could have gotten a root account, how much they had to override the whole thing. So, um, Computers around me tend to break, and that's why i am you know, always been interested in, in, in that kind of stuff. So um, I, I published a book um, uh, last year on how stupid people, stupid assumptions made by smart people tend to cause really interesting problems. 
And I've sent the book to a couple of my friends to kind of, you know, get their feedback on it. And I have a friend uh, called Sigge who lives in Sweden who was really angry that he didn't get my book. He's like, but I sent it. You know, I, I, I sent the book to you. Um, and I, I got in touch with my printer and said, have you sent this book? He said, yeah, we sent the book. So, yeah, you know, he, he says he didn't get it. And then they called the shipper and said, well, the shipper says uh, they sent it to Sweden, but it's still in Sweden in a warehouse because it has an invalid address. It's like, okay. I called Siggy and said, you've given me a stupid address. You know, uh, give, me, give me your right address. And he sent me their address again. I copy and paste it to, in an email. My printer says, okay, you know, we sent this address over. And a week later, Siggy still not received the book and the, the address is still invalid. I said, fuck it, I can't deal with this. I, I kind of uh, give me their phone number and I gave Siggy their phone number. So he gets in touch with the Swedish people in Sweden. And a week later, he has a book and he receives a book with this thing on the address, on the envelope. We are talking about 2017, where, you know, three different systems talking to each other, one of them is losing Unicode data. And people in Sweden are, you know, not smart enough to say, well, there's, there's two blanks here, something went wrong. So at the end, the only way they could get it into the system is to handwrite it. And we're talking about one of the big, 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 you know, three shipping systems that has three letters in the name. In Sweden, their system doesn't deal with Swedish addresses. So, so you know, the, 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 this is insane. This is completely insane. And we, we're getting into the stage in our industry where computers are getting smarter and smarter. We're doing very, very interesting stuff. So there's a research paper published from uh, Radboud University last year and Google. Radboud University in the US has this standardized test for radiologists. So these are people who study for, you know, 10 years to spot cancer and leukemia on radiology images. And the best human ever scored 73% on the test. Google's image recognition algorithm, after being trained on it, scored 89%. So the best human ever, 73% Google, Google's image recognition, 89%. So we have computers that can recognize images better than the best trained human ever because they can see millions and millions of images over a lifetime. They can improve, they can train. It's amazing stuff what we can do now with technology, but we can't send books to Sweden. No, that's, you know, that's too far. So, um, and, and we're getting into the stage in our industry where this thing is starting to open up some really interesting moral challenges, what we can do. So um, I, around the same time where Radbond published this research where their, their image, Google's image recognition algorithm did this stuff, um, at Stanford University they published this quite controversial research where some image recognition algorithm they developed there could recognize if somebody is gay from a photo with an 81% accuracy. And this starts opening up some really, really interesting moral dilemmas, like, you know, what are we doing with these algorithms now? And once we start working on stuff like that, you know, we, we can ruin people's lives quite horribly by making some stupid bugs. So there, there, were, there was a really interesting story I, I read about two lovely girls called Alicia and Alison Kennedy, this is them, who live in a place called Evans in Georgia. Now, in Georgia, in the US, pedestrians are prohibited by law. So everybody's in a car, and the first thing you do when you're 16 years old, you go and get the driver's license, because that's what everybody does there. So Alice and Alison turned 16. They went to the local driving o driver's registration office, or whatever they call it in Georgia, in 2015, and they applied for uh, the test to take a driver's license. When they gave out their forms to the lady behind the counter, the lady typed up everything, and the computer said no. The computer said, Alison's photo is not good enough. Alison needs to take the photo again. So she went and took the photo again, and then she submitted this, and then the other kind of um, uh, form for her sister, Alicia, computer then started rejecting that and said, now this form is not good. She needs to go and sign again. So she went and signed again, and then when the lady typed in her form, the other form got bounced off the system. And after about 10 of cycles like this, the computer just gave up and said, fuck it, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> Called the headquarters. And 
um, the, the lady behind the counter called the headquarters and there was a lot of, hmm, yes, no, hmm, what? And then the kind of the girls overheard something talking about uh, kind of an FBI anti-terrorism database. <laughs> and the lady said, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to let you kind of take the, the, the driver's tests. And because, you know, pedestrians are not legal in uh, Georgia, these girls got really angry, somebody called the local TV station, a local TV station called the driver's registration office. They started researching this. And what it turns out to have happened is now that kind of, you know, it's 2017, 2018, everything is connected to everything else. You apply for a driver's license, that gets put into something else, that gets put into something else, that gets put into something else. And there was an image recognition algorithm that was trying to spot people that are on a terrorist list or kind of spot people doing something dodgy in the FBI. Um, and because these two girls were twins, it could not differentiate between twins. So it was trying, it was what the computer in the FBI was saying is, oh, I have somebody, I have the same person applying under two different names. Must be a terrorist. There's no other explanation. <laughs> it's not a software bug. It must be a terrorist, so you know, deny. Because what you definitely don't want to do is let terrorists drive cars. That's, you know, that's... So, I mean, look, you and I can see that these two girls are different people. No, they're not the same person, but there was a stupid bug in the computer. And it's not just kind of uh, uh, that. Th there was a guy called John Gass uh, in Massachusetts in 2011 who ran into a similar problem um, for no reason at all. His driver's license was just canceled in 2011. Nobody told him. And, like, the, the, you know, he had problems because th th that's the only ID there that he had. And it turns out that his driver's license was canceled because some image recognition algorithm somewhere matched his name to somebody who was recently released from prison. So, you know, these weird bugs keep happening. Everything is connected to everything else. There was a hospital in Grand Rapids in, Ma in, in Missouri a couple of years ago that as they were migrating data from one database to another, somebody failed to spot that the legacy database has alpha numeric IDs, not just numeric IDs. And then did a parsing and completely ignored letters. And as a result of that, they, that during the migration, they declared about 10% of the people in the city dead. <laughs> and because this was a hospital that can declare people dead, the computer was connected to all the other computers. So all the government computers declared those people dead. Um, all the insurance computers declared to those people. So it's, you know, it's a massive carnage that never happened because just somebody made a stupid assumption. And we, we, we're getting into this state where, you know, everything is connected to everything else. Computers are doing much more smarter things. So this bank of mine that's, you know, fantastic and has fantastic algorithms, I got an email from them last year offering this completely new service. Uh, and they said, look, you know, this is amazing. We have this new service. People hate passwords. Do you hate passwords? They said, yeah, yeah, I fucking hate passwords. Said, we have something that's much, much better than passwords. So can we get the sound up? Hello? Tech guy. <laughs> Audio, can we get the sound up? I need to switch from HDMI again. Computers always break around me. We tested this. <laughs> we tested this 10 minutes ago. OK. Voice ID is a new way to access your telephone banking without having to use and remember passwords. Your voice is unique. Our software can analyze over a hundred unique features, from your pronunciation to the size and shape of your mouth. It can recognize you even if you have a cold or a sore throat. So I got an email asking, would you like to stop using passwords and use something like this? And it's like, no! <laughs> <laughs> you are insane. So, uh, you know, you and I know how many stupid things can happen here. But this thing can, you know, recognize the shape of my mouth somehow over the telephone. It can recognize me when I have a cold. My own wife can't recognize me when I have a cold over the phone. 
And this is, it's insane. It's just insane. What, you know, and, and people trust this shit. And like it, it, took, it took BBC less than 10 days to crack this. There was, uh, the, this is um, Dan Simmons and his uh, brother Joe, twin brothers, who, you know, were able to log on to one of our, one each other's account less than 10 days after these guys launched this. So kind of, you know, the, 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 I think if you want to have a career in software testing in the future, the best thing you can do is to become a twin. <laughs> um, you're not going to be able to get the driver's license, but you will be able to spend your brother's or sister's money. So, hey, you know, result. So we're getting to the state where this thing is completely, completely insane. But, we, we, I mean, voice recognition, image recognition, that's all, you know, at the edge of technology. We are, as an industry, incredibly bad, even at things that are much, 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 much simpler. So most of people in this room, I assume, are not going to be working on an image recognition anti-terrorism database, hopefully. And, uh, but we, we, we all need to work on stuff that needs to prevent fraud. Mo most people today work on kind of some clients facing stuff that needs to recognize people, prevent fraud. Everything is connected to everything else. We work on stuff that needs to kind of recognize personal details, GDPR and, and stuff like that made all of that a lot more interesting. So I want to talk about something that, you know, we as an industry still cannot conquer in 2018, although we're trying to do that for the last 50 years, and something that hopefully is going to be a lot more practical kind of for everybody, and that's kind of how even with the kind of simple stuff that's like personal data, overconfident models, can create silly, silly problems if your software needs to be globally available, which most software today does. Because culturally, we grew up in, in one environment where we make silly assumptions about something. And you know that, that, that's, a, that's a big, big effect. There was a research published two years ago uh, from a collaboration between a university in Japan and a university in California where they, where they kind of proved that Face recognition algorithms developed in Asia are much, much better at kind of guessing East Asian profiles. They make mistakes with kind of white people. They make horrible mistakes with black people. Algorithms developed in kind of California are much, much better guessing kind of white faces. They're worse guessing kind of uh, Asian people faces, and they're horrible at guessing black people's faces. So uh, yeah, kind of we have this whole problem where, you know, even when we start training algorithms to do something, we train them based on our knowledge. So 2018, kind of there's a, a guy called Kamal Armarubi who, is, who cannot get a ticket from Air Canada because his name is invalid. He has to enter first name and last name. The guy has two last names. Or, or a space in a last name, de how, depending on how you want to call it. And an airline doesn't want to let him buy a ticket. And, you know, we, we have this, again, on another side of the world, people make different types of stupid mistakes. There are, there, I found this on Twitter two days ago. There's kind of some, uh, Ivan Herzig, who I think is from Croatia, got called Ivan Herzig now in Chile because everybody has two last names there. There you know, can't possibly be somebody without two last names. <laughs> and <coughs> 2018, people, 2018, we are still making stupid mistakes like this. And I think, you know, now is, is, is a particularly interesting edge case here because of, of our love for null. I think Tony Hoare called null his $2 billion mistake. There was one of the most popular Stack Overflow posts from 2014 was about um, some kind of a university employee system where they, they employed the Vietnamese guy whose last name is Null, <laughs> <laughs> which completely broke the system every time you search for it. And you know, when people figured that out, they started searching for it more and more and more. And <laughs> So in 2018, we really shouldn't be making stupid mistakes like this, but we are. And especially when we start looking at, you know, what is a valid name? Th that is a problem that, you know, we, mo most people working on systems that have users need to deal with. How do you spot a valid name? How do you spot an invalid name? How do you prevent fraud 
but still allow people to buy airline tickets. Because if you get it too strict, then you lose business. If you make it too relaxed, you have fraud. And, and it's very, very difficult to draw the line there. So I want to tell you a couple of stories. This is Elaine. Elaine uh, lives in South Dakota. And in 2014, she was a student at a local university there. As a kind of a, a student in the US, you don't really get any expenses paid, unlike Northern Europe, where I assume everything is free. So Elaine had to work while studying. And unlike most students that go and work on some kind of shitty low paid job and things like that, she was relatively smart. So she decided to start her own business. She decided to start a coffee delivery business online because it was 2014 and you can kind of do stuff online. And she used a bunch of tools. She was smart to wire up a bunch of, you know, a, a CRM, Google Docs, and things like that to kind of automate the bulk of it. Incredibly smart for a student. Amazingly, amazingly good. And then one day in 2014, the whole thing was shut down by Google without any explanation. She could no longer get into her kind of Google account. She couldn't get into anything else. Uh, she had orders falling through. She, you know, it's like chaos, chaos. She tried to contact Google about it, but you can imagine what happens when an individual contacts Google to see what's happening with their Google account, like zero response. Now, she's in panic, and because she's a Native American, a kind of First Nation American, um, she uh, was interviewed by a journalist a couple of months before that, it was a lucky break, about some kind of uh, the life on, on the re re reservation and things like that. So she got in touch with the journalist and she said, look, I have this big problem, I, you know, can you help? And he wrote a uh, kind of article about how Google closed the account of a promising entrepreneurial young student who's now desperate and she can't get any response from anything. And, you know, wh wh what's going on? And it turns out that Google decided that her name is fake. Now, Elaine is a kind of First Nation American. Is full, her full name is Elaine Yellow Horse. <laughs> and in 2014, Google launched Google Plus that wanted to compete with Facebook. And a big thing about Google Plus is going to be people have real names on Google Plus. You cannot cheat Google Plus. And because everything is connected to everything else, some stupid algorithm for guessing fake names said, oh, this is a fake name, Yellow Horse, cannot possibly be a, you know, a real name. So they closed her Google Plus account. She never had a Google Plus account, doesn't matter. But because everything is connected to everything else, they closed her Google email. And because he, she was using Google Apps for work and things like that, they kind of shut the whole thing down. Now, this is completely insane. You know, person called Yellow Horse, why, why not? I mean, you know, no Norwegian last names might sound weird to somebody in Serbia. My last name might sound like a fake name to people. But, you know, is that really a reason that, you know, when somebody launches a completely irrelevant service that nobody ever wanted to use, you close people's business accounts. I mean, why? It's insane. It's completely insane. So, you know, and, and, and this thing now um, is, is becoming more and more of a problem when you had globalization and these big American systems that are trying to decide who's a valid person, who's not a valid person, because you get really, really weird names for people around the world. For example, So, Batman, the son of Superman, became famous when he tried to rob a kind of a, a, a corner store in Singapore and the owner kicked the shit out of him. So, even if you're Batman, the son of Superman, it doesn't really matter you that good, it doesn't really mean you're that good at fighting. So, well, you know, and, and, and who knows what's a valid name, what's not a valid name. There was a famous um, thing in uh, 2015 where an Australian guy got his um, Facebook account closed. And he started complaining to newspapers in Australia. And because of this whole, you know, newspapers now hate social networks thing, um, everybody picked it up. CNN picked it up, BBC picked it up, New York Times picked it up. It was all over the world. People were saying, oh, how, you know, uh, big software companies are insensitive to minorities and, and there are people who are not from a white kind of background and how we are horribly insensitive because he was called... 
So, it was on news everywhere, everywhere, all around the world. The BBC got the BBC Vietnamese editor called Nga Pham to explain the whole problem. So let's, let's just see if the sound is going to work for us. Vietnamese is a tonal language, so tones or accents are very important. According to his passport, Mr. Big's surname is Big, not Big, not Big, but Big. And his given names are Phuc Dat. Phuc, <laughs> not Phuc. Dat, not Dat, but Dat, Dat. <laughs> so the whole name would be Phuc Dat Big. Phuc Dat Big. <laughs> so, um, about a week after this whole thing happened, uh, there was a kind of, the, 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 a local Australian comedian said, I just invented the whole thing <laughs> and fooled the whole world. Kind of, so this whole thing was a fake. They, he, he, he was able to kind of uh, get BBC, CNN, New York Times, and everybody else to do stuff like this. So, <laughs> I mean, the conclusion out of this is, you know, even if somebody's called Batman the son of Superman, it doesn't mean it's fake. And even if New York Times, CNN, and BBC are telling you something is valid, that just doesn't mean like that. And you know, if the best journalists in the world cannot get this right, what chance do we as software developers have? This is insane. So, um, plus you have a much, much bigger problem today because in most countries, people can change their name to almost anything. So there was a guy called David Fern in 2006 who was a big fan of James Bond movies. And when kind of uh, the James Bond movie of 2006 came out, got to kind of the UK did Paul service where he can change names and changed his name to James Dr. No from Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, blah, 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 Casino Royale Bond. <laughs> that is his legal name. Perfectly valid name. Why not? I mean, if... Somebody's insane, somebody's insane. That's, you know, do you want to let them buy an airline ticket to spend money on your system? Probably, why not? I mean, so, you know, we, 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 can, change, start, we can change names to almost anything now, and, and different countries really kind of um, have different rules. Uh, there was a um, famous case here in Norway, I think, a couple of years ago, um, and, and um, where a kid tried to change his name and, and wasn't allowed. Um, and w kind of because the name is apparently kind of a, a too fake or is not going to give the child a good childhood and things like that. So um, generally, I think um, the most important thing to remember is although a big part of our job is to spot fake stuff, there is no universal agreement of what is real and what is fake. And as people can change the name to almost anything, um, there's a kind of couple of rules that different countries impose. So uh, w w Germany being Germany, of course, has very, very strict rules. So in Germany, kind of the key rule is that the name has to indicate gender. You cannot give a boy a girl's name or a girl a boy's name. But there is an exception, and the exception is Maria. For some reason, in Germany, you're legally allowed to call your son Maria. Um, Denmark has uh, 7,000 pre-approved names. So if you're from Denmark, just kind of they said, look, there's 7,000 names, you choose one of them and that's it. Norway uh, had a, uh, a strict law until 2011, I think, or something like that. Um, and they, they've relaxed it a bit, but in Norway, even today, uh, the rule, at least according to kind of the data I found on the internet, is the last name you give to a child has to be a name that at least 200 other people have. Or you need special approval. And kind of, I think for the first name as well, if fewer than 200 people have that first name, you have to have special approval, which I think opens up a really interesting race condition situation. If I could get 200 people in Norway whose kids are born on the same ta date to maybe, you know, try and get a really weird name, the big question is, you know, would that get accepted or not? I don't know. That's an interesting thing. So um, th there was, I said, a case where this kid uh, a couple of years ago wanted to get a name with fewer than 200 people and got rejected and sent a letter to the king personally. <laughs> and 
he wanted to kind of get the approval from the king to get called Sonic X. <laughs> and the king kind of politely rejected it. And I think the, the, the key explanation was that he's not 18 years old yet. So he's not allowed to do that. But as you go over 18 years, even in Norway, you can do whatever you like. So look how happy this guy is. This is the person with uh, officially the longest name in Norway. Now, I know that the next pic is going to be a bit pixelated. So kind of I don't know how much you can see on it. Come on. So this is his kind of ID card, and it says uh, LSR Yankov, Julius, Andreas, uh, and then Arn, Maggie. So it doesn't look particularly long, but his real name is Julius Andreas Gimli, Arn MacGyver Chewbacca, Highlander, LSR Yankov. <laughs> so I assume people at the kind of registration office didn't have a heart to tell him that this is not the way to spell Chewbacca. <laughs> Um, so uh, he changed his name in 2009 very quickly after the laws go, uh, law got kind of relaxed. Uh, and he, he's a bus driver from Oppegard. I don't know where Oppegard is, but I assume it gets very boring there when people do shit like this. So, you know, um, th th there is no way to say, well, you know, Elisar Gimli, that's kind of... Lord of the Rings, Chewbacca, all the misspelled is Star Wars, y y Highlander. Kind of, all the other movies are actually okay, but why Highlander? That's, <laughs> so, and you know, we, we kind of, but it, that's a valid name. And lo, you know, look how happy he is. <laughs> <laughs> so, kind of, the, of course, kind of governments sometimes step in. If, if, if you're trying to push this too far, the governments will step in. So there was a famous case of, of uh, two people who were kind of anarchists in Sweden a couple of years ago, in 2009, I think, who tried to call their son this. And so, oh, 1996, sorry. And, and uh, they was rejected by the courts because it's unpronounceable. And the mother said, no, no, it's perfectly pronounceable. This is pronounced Albin. <laughs> so... <laughs> In Sweden as well, somebody wanted to call their child Metallica, which was rejected because it's a name of a band. And uh, there was another kind of case called Allah that was, yeah, a bit interesting. So Swedish courts tend to reject lots of names, I think. Um, but there was a, a name called For Real that was rejected in New Zealand. Um, I guess, again, in New Zealand, people get bored. And um, uh, there was a, a case where in China, two parents wanted to kind of find something unique to give to their kind of little baby. You have two, mil two billion people in China, and they wanted to say, well, you know, this and it was rejected because you cannot kind of, it's not a Chinese character. Um, but um, so th th that's kind of, um, you know, we're, we're getting into this thing where the governments will reject stuff that is too silly. But the big question is, you know, how silly is too silly? And sometimes these things take a really, really weird turn. I know, like I said, in Sweden, government rejects lots of names. Norway, government rejects lots of names as well. And uh, there was a case uh, in 1998 where um, a woman wanted to call her son uh, Gesher, which is a bridge in, in Hebrew, and the courts rejected that, and she refused to kind of... Um, rename her son, and then they had a bit of a fight about that, and the kind of she went to prison for that and left husband and ten children at home. I think this was actually just kind of a, um, a way to get away from ten children for a couple of days, I think. Uh, but, um, you know, weird stuff happens. So, um, l l let's play a little game. Um, if we look at kind of, you know, I'll give you a couple of names, you tell me whether you think this is fake or real. So, the first name is iPhone SIM. Would you, would you prevent people from registering as iPhone SIM, or is this a valid name? Who, who thinks this is fake? Okay, about half of the room. So, iPhone SIM is the name, the new name of a guy called Alexander Turin, 
who in 2016 changed his name in Ukraine as part of a marketing campaign. The local Apple phone distributor in Ukraine said they're going to give a free iPhone 7 to people who change their name to iPhone 7. iPhone SIM actually means iPhone 7 in Ukrainian. So, <laughs> yeah, change, change the name, got the phone, so why not? So, <coughs> Buzz Lightyear. Fake or real? Would you prevent somebody called Buzz Lightyear for registering? Who thinks this is fake? Okay, fewer people, so there are about 10. Buzz Lightyear was uh, an act, you know, actual person, still exists, became famous in um, 2016, where he got caught for speeding in Devon. He was going about 70 kilometers an hour where we could go 60. <laughs> and journalists had a kind of lots of fun saying, you know, Buzz Lightyear got a speeding ticket. <laughs> so, okay, so Google Kai. <laughs> fake or real? Who thinks this is fake? Okay, one well, more, okay. Google Kai is actually kind of a, a, a real name of a boy born in Sweden in 2005. Um, his father, according to the newspaper article I, I read, is a search engine optimization specialist. <laughs> so um, this is either the lamest possible attempt at promoting his business or the smartest possible way to make sure that his kid is invisible on the internet. So who's going to kind of find Google, Google, Googling for Google, like? Um, so, now you see where this is going. There is a little girl called Facebook Jamal Ibrahim, born in Egypt in 2011. After the whole kind of Arab Spring and, and revolutions where they use social media to coordinate without kind of being caught by the government, one of the local activists there was so impressed with Facebook, he decided to call his daughter Facebook. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in what's going to happen when Facebook becomes old enough to open a Facebook account, <laughs> whether she will get rejected or not, uh, because they're much, much stricter about real names there. And my favorite one is number 16 bus shelter. <laughs> Actual name of a baby born in New Zealand couple of years ago. I think the official explanation is that's where he was conceived. <laughs> so the next time you're doing name validation and you think, well, you know, I can't possibly put digits in a name. Yeah, you can in New Zealand. <laughs> so um, it, it's almost impossible to, to spot whether something is fake or real. And that's kind of a big problem, I think. Um, so. As, you know, as, as developers, we often have to deal with these things, but please, 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 please. Just because you think something is fake, don't block somebody's business. Um, flag it for manual investigation. Let people kind of send you documents. Let, let, you know, they, be, you'll be surprised. I mean, whatever you think is fake or real, you'll be surprised with, with this stuff. So please don't block this stuff automatically. And kind of when we talk about fake or real, um, there's a whole different category of people where it's not necessarily fake or real, but the computers decide to go crazy about them. One of my favorite stories about that is um, this guy called Jeff, who in 2015 wanted to go and visit Patagonia in, in uh, Argentina. So he was going to fly from uh, Washington to Patagonia. There's no direct flight, so he bought a connecting ticket through Buenos Aires. Perfectly normal thing to do. Perfectly normal thing to do. Most people in this room have bought a connecting ticket at some point in their lives, probably. So he gets onto the plane in Washington, goes to Buenos Aires, goes to kind of change to the other flight. The kind of um, attendants at the airport try to check him in, and the computer says, nope. This person does not have a ticket for this flight, although he's holding a ticket in his hands. And he's stuck at the airport. He spends about a whole day at the airport trying to figure out what's going on because they can't find him in the system. He never had a ticket. And he says, I have a connecting ticket. I bought a ticket on this website. Look, uh, paper, look, you know, email. He calls his bank to try and get, at least get a refund. The bank says, no, but they took your money. You need to go and ask the com. So there's this whole thing with the travel website, the bank, 
the one airline, another airline, chaos. He spends five hours on the phone, and at the end, a kind of, they try to kind of give him a ticket, and they buy another ticket for him, and he goes to board the plane, and the computer says, nope, he's not on this flight. And kind of, he, he after, you know, it's like complete chaos caused by the fact that his full name is Jeff Sample. So, <laughs> because everything is connected to everything else, testing in production is something that lots and lots of teams do. We have kind of uh, transactions we book on this end, we try to see if they're on this end, and we delete them because they shouldn't go into the accounts. Lots of people do something like this for their integration test in production, and this Argentinian website had testing tickets that were being bought every 10 minutes or so for sample and automatically deleting it. So, you know, why not? <laughs> um, and th this is insane uh, because you know, people shouldn't be punished because the last name is Sample. Uh, if you go to the um, uh, US white pages where you can search for people's phone numbers, there's lots and lots of people called Test. And I assume, you know, they're getting into lots of weird problems like this. There's a, you know, a doctor called Victor James Test. Uh, there's a voice artist called Tom Test. I found about him uh, when I read an article how is this whole problem signing up for these freelancer websites. Because as a voice artist, he works as a freelancer. He kind of sends um, bids to people that get automatically deleted because they think some, you know, the end, the end computer thinks this is just somebody else doing a test. Um, there's a whole group of people that have these weird problems. I read about a lady called Jennifer Null they had a problem submitting a tax return in the US as the com computer couldn't accept the tax return. So we have these people, and, and you know, if we talk about test data, uh, the lovely thing about the kind of this screen is if you look at the third person there, test, test. So test, test has, you know, some family members, the, the first family member is Comcast test. Comcast is a big telecoms provider in the US. And um, they're all based in Plainfield, New Jersey, where the Comcast kind of data center is. So kind of test, test, you can click on him, and actually that's a test account for voice over IP services. So you can call test, test, and it's a test. It's a perfectly valid thing. But because everything is connected to everything else these days, you have a public service like this that kind of pulls data from other sources. So you have test, test that got born 70 times, died once and got divorced twice. <laughs> so, you know, the kind of test data is, uh, you know, insane, but th th there's a, we shouldn't be putting people through punishment just because they have test data on, on their names. Um, so, I think one, one of the most important things, if you do any kind of testing in production, more and more people need to do testing in production these days. Please don't use magic values. Don't think just because somebody has an account number 11111111 that that's invalid. It's kind of perfectly valid stuff that can happen like that. My favorite story about something like this is, is a guy called Richard Barber who um, lives in LA. He um, had a company, became rich, sold the company, and what people from LA do when they sell the company and they become rich, well, they buy an expensive car and they buy a boat. So he got and bought the boat and he was impressed about his boat, and after he bought an expensive car, he did the third thing kind of rich people in LA do. He got and want to get a kind of custom license plates. So he went to kind of the local drivers, the, the DM, the DMV, whatever the department is, to get kind of a custom license plate. And the computer form there has three fields, three options, because your first option might not be available. So as his first two options, he put in boating and sailing, because you know he just bought a boat. And he couldn't think of a third option. So he wrote down no plates. And of course, he got no plates as the license plates. So. That was fun for a while, and he was driving around the car called No Plates until he started getting parking tickets from all over the US. 
because everywhere else when kind of the traffic officers found an illegally parked car without plates, the computer system was inflexible enough so they couldn't put a blank plate in and they typed no plates. So at some point he started getting more than 2,000 parking tickets a month. <laughs> so because they couldn't, you know, the, 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 he was appearing in court so, so frequently, and, you know, he's rich, so he paid lawyers to actually sue the Department of Motor Vehicles. And he won in court, and the, the uh, judge ordered the Department of Motor Vehicles to change their systems. Now, we are talking about hundreds and hundreds of legacy systems connected in insane ways. So you're not going to change that overnight. And what the Department of Motor Vehicles did is just issued a guideline, like, do not type in no plates anymore. Type in anything else, like missing or something like that, which was brilliant until a guy who lived literally a kilometer south from Richard started getting all those parking tickets. He had the license plates missing for eight years without any problems and now started getting all this crap. So, you know, <laughs> this is insane. So, going back to the topic of what's valid, what's invalid, you know, and upgrading the systems, this is a driver's license of a lady called Janice I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name, sorry. Um, Janice has 37 characters in her last name. This is 36. There's a letter E missing. And in um, 2013, she married a local um, a Hawaiian guy with this last name, wanted to change her last name to a, her new last name, and when she got the driver's license, kind of one letter fell off, she got really angry. People get personally attached to their names. And because this is a Hawaiian last name and this is whole big thing where, you know, computer systems are inflexible to people who are not white and, and kind of American, she called the local TV station. A local TV station made some news, uh, kind of... A regional TV station picked it up, CNN picked it up. There was a lot of pressure from Hawaiian rights groups and things like that. And they had to spend something like $140 million upgrading the systems all over the state. Just because somebody, you know, a couple of years ago when designing a system said, well, nobody's ever going to have more than 36 characters in a name. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent on upgrading systems because of that. And, you know, this... Why not? I mean, data is so cheap these days. How much does it cost to store one more character? And, you know, but at some point we need to have a limit. What, what, is, what is a reasonable limit for a last name? That becomes a really interesting question. So there's a famous guy called Herbert Blaine Wolf plus 585 senior who was born in Germany in the uh, 1920s, emigrated to the US. He's famous because he broke the IBM 7074 supercomputer in 1974. When he emigrated to the US and get, wanted to get a social security license issued because his full name is Hubert Blaine Wolf and then 585 characters after that. His father was um, a typographer and, uh, sorry, a typesetter who was working on kind of printing papers and stuff. And, hey, wanted to have a bit of fun. When the son was born in 1920s, went and registered with this name. <laughs> People before, born before computers don't fall under the same constraints as we do today. And, you know, perfectly valid person had to get a government ID issued, broke the 7074 supercomputer. And now we can talk about, okay, stuff like this doesn't happen anymore, but it does, it does. Uh, kind of 1986, this is uh, the, the full name of a girl born in the UK. So has 855 letters in the name. Norway wouldn't allow that, but the UK does. The Guinness World Record is a girl called uh, Rosa something. Um, she was born in 1982 in Texas. I guess this proves that people in Texas are crazy. Um, even the Guinness World Book of Records said, screw this, we're not going to print the whole name. <laughs> uh, but, you know, th that's a valid person's name. So, kind of, 
when we get to this stuff, of course, different governments have different standards. And if you, you can look at different things, kind of one of my favorite problems to deal with is how short can a name be? And there's a famous case of a guy called Nakibullah on a completely other end of this problem. So Nakibullah is a Afghan uh, translator. He worked as a translator for the US Army when they were kind of shooting people in Afghanistan. And when you work as a translator for the occupation forces, you're not exactly that safe when they go back home. So what they did is they gave him a kind of immigration, uh, immigration paper so he can move to the US because he can't do much in the US with kind of just the knowledge of English, he became a Uber driver. And Nakibullah has only one name. He doesn't have a first name and a last name. He has only one name. Because the never needed a surname in an Afghan village, kind of everybody knows everybody else. Um, when he moved to the US, US has some special rules because Computers kind of there require somebody to have a last name. So instead of upgrading all the computer systems everywhere, different government agencies created different rules to handle cases like this. And in his particular case, he emigrated to Washington where the rule is that you get your single name assigned to be your last name and you get a marker on the ID document called first name unknown or FNU. Now, because it's called Nakibula, Nobody knows how to pronounce that, and his driver license is Fnu Nakibula. Everybody calls him Fnu. Fnu is his first name now. <laughs> it's completely insane. And I found, um, I found a lady called Sadia who, who emigrated from uh, Indonesia, where they also have people without two names, into the US. Her official papers call her no name given Sadia. So that, that's, that's her passport now. So, I mean, this is completely insane. And um, kind of there's a couple of rules about this. So in the UK, you get XXX plus a surname because, of course, systems design in the UK think you have to have two names. Um, in US Immigration Service, you get FNU, but sometimes you get name and a LNU. So, uh, and also kind of you might get name plus other name for some airline services. TripAdvi Tri TripAdvisor forums are full of people getting rejected at uh, border checkpoints, getting rejected by airlines because one system says they should be called FNU something and the other system says they should be called something something. So this is completely insane. And you know, in Europe, we're not kind of really aware of things that, but they do exist. Um, ICAO, who is the international standards body for travel documents, has their own standards. And as a standards body, kind of they have multiple standards for everything else. Um, most governments actually now decided they're going to take these standards. So most developers should ideally develop to at least these standards. But you have a data interchange standard that says you're allowed to have 64 characters in a name plus a surname plus three middle names, each 64 characters. Um, but on passports, you need to print them between 10 and 15 characters per inch, which means that on a typical passport, there's only place for 40 characters. So we have a single organization with two different standards that are incompatible. Uh, and they have a machine-readable passport standard that says your name has to include 39 letters, including spaces, which is, again, completely insane. So. You know, if, if, if uh, governments and organizations like this can't agree, we as developers have no chance on getting any valid stuff on this. But try to be as permissive as possible. So in the UK, for example, the UK government says single letter names are OK. In Sweden, that's not allowed. In the US, that's not allowed as well. There's a famous case of a guy called Stephen O, just O as the last name, emigrating from Korea to the US, where when he wanted to get the driver's license, the system said, initials are not allowed. You have to put the full last name. He said, but that's my full last name. And then the typist said, OK, O and two spaces. Got accepted. <laughs> Unfortunately, at the bank, they typed him in as OO. And at the Social Security Service, they typed him in as OH. So nothing matched, and he was flagged by all the possible security flags everywhere. So um, 
the UK data standard says you are allowed to have 35 characters per name, uh, but there's, a, there's another data standard that says you're allowed to have 70, kind of in total with all the names. And the deed poll service, like you've seen, James Bond, blah, blah, blah. If you want to get the standard free service, that's 150 characters. If you pay 20 quid, you can call yourself whatever you want. They'll take your money. So the US is even more insane. In the US, on your visa application, you're allowed to put 31 characters in a name. On your arrival card, when you get there, 17. So if you're more than that, you're screwed. Your visa is not going to match your arrival card. Um, the social security, when kind of people start working, there is 26, but the passport has different lengths for name, last name, just insane, completely insane. So kind of, I think as, as a conclusion, um, please, 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 I know that most people here have to have some data standard in their database for name, last name, but th th understand there is no universal standard. Data is cheap. Just let people type stuff in. That is kind of, you know, you're not going to pay an insane amount of money if you let people have one more character in the last name, but you might prevent an expensive upgrade two years later when the TV stations are kind of pointing at you and saying your company is racist because, I don't know, you know, you're not accepting Hawaiian names. So, kind of, there's some ideas that are really useful for this. One, one idea that the um, web uh, consortium says is don't ask people for a first name and a last name. 99% of registration forms ask for a first name and last name, just don't. Because there are people who don't have that. Some people have three, some people have 20, some people have one. The big reason why most registration forms have a first name and a last name is you want to be able to put a formal address to somebody, but you also want to be able to say, hi, Mike, we're going to send you this marketing document, you know, and we're fun, so don't necessarily take us too serious. So if you really need to have a shorter thing, ask people what their preferred shorter name is and make that as short as you want. So kind of, but ask for a full name where they can type stuff in if you need a formal legal name as a single field. So I think today, because the governments have given up on standardizing kind of this, and they're mostly just delegating to ICAO, supporting at least ICAO standard, which is kind of 64 per, per name, at least four names is good. But then again, just let people type in 256. It's not going to be over a thousand. Like, why not? I mean, if you really need a full legal name, why not? If you don't need a full legal name, then, you know, let them type in something shorter, but don't ask them for their full name. So, um, again, please, please, please escalate the validation of these things. Don't block people for being fake because they have two last names or not have a last name. And lastly, please recognize that certain things or names are actually markers, like FNUL, NU, XXX, or kind of doubling the name. And that's because you're dealing with some horrible system that somebody developed 10 years ago. Don't make people suffer if they have something like that in the name. If the name in your system doesn't perfectly match something else, don't immediately block it. Some of these things might actually be markers. And somebody who says they're called Nakibula might be actually kind of, you, got, you might get in Fnu Nakibula. I don't know what the Norwegian kind of thing is. But if things don't match perfectly, it might be because they're being punished by somebody else's system. Don't let your system punish them as well. So thanks very much uh, kind of for, for staying here. Um, and if you want to kind of learn any more about any of these stories, I have a lot more details in humans versus computers. Thanks very much. Thank you.